January is almost over. If you hadn't noticed, I don't know if you've looked at the calendar. We've almost made it through the first month of the year. Don't give up yet. We've got another day to go before we get to that place. Uh, some of you kiddos know we got Nerf and Nachos tonight, and you're excited about that. We don't run, want to run too far forward too fast. Uh, but listen, we are just getting into the year. And I know that this is about the time, this is about the time most years that those that uh, have started or sought to start some kind of new routine or new habit. This is, this is that time that uh, they start selling off all that exercise equipment. Uh, it's the time that the, uh, the gym membership has, sw- has swollen, maybe for another month or so, but it's going to, you know, the routines are already falling away. And I'm going to encourage you, like we, we have talked about resolution. Uh, Daniel resolved that he was going to honor God. He wouldn't defile himself. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they stood alongside him. And together, those guys Uh, They stood in a place all by themselves and sought to honor God. And I want to encourage you uh, that as we continue to press forward into this new space, this new year, it's not just about, you're like, really, New Year's? No, no, no. As we press into the days that we're living in, it is in these days that we must put into our life with routine things that will help us to navigate successfully uh, and with a good attitude and with a right heart, right heart towards God, regardless of what the day brings. Uh, it is those very habits that are going to, to help us when we are tossed with circumstances that we didn't expect. Uh, those habits will keep us, hopefully, from looking backward and getting paralyzed by the events of the day or the things that didn't go the way that we thought that they should have or even in a way that we don't think is fair. Um, and it is, it is that very thing that will strengthen and empower us to stay focused, looking forward, so that our goal uh, can be accomplished, which is to to press on, uh, to to, to grow more like Jesus Christ in this year, in this day, uh, and in this year that we live. A little something extra for you guys, and I I, want to keep this kind of... not, I don't, I'm not going to say want to keep it amongst us. That's not, not ever going to happen. Uh, I trust you all and everything, but this is, this is going to be on Facebook. But, but the reality is that I think many times we look at the course of the week or the month, and you name, like there's always, um, there's always a new thing that the day is to celebrate. Like somebody mystically comes up with a list, and then it's a thing, and then everybody else jumps on board with what the thing is. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm all for whatever the thing of the day is, if it's worthy of celebration and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to tell you, it, so you don't lose focus. It dawned on me this week that as a believer in Jesus Christ, today is the day to celebrate Jesus is risen. As a matter of fact, tomorrow is too. And so is this whole week. 2022 should be that day. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to hear me say this. Like, it's okay to have awareness. Like, our whole lives after we choose Christ should be about pressing forward in Him, becoming more like Him, and celebrating the King of Kings and Lords. Does that kind of make sense to you? Doesn't mean that you gotta, you know, doesn't mean you can't wear certain colors at certain months or celebrate certain things at other times uh, or even certain days, even like Happy Chocolate Day or whatever it was last week. And I think there was another day that was, I don't, I don't remember what they all were. You, you get my point? I'm losing you. All right. Hang with me right here just for a second. I want to tell you about an incredible animal. Can I tell you about an incredible animal? Uh, An incredible animal that I don't want you to be like. I don't know if it's fair to say that, uh, but the African impala is uh, is a beautiful animal. I mean, just look at the picture there. I mean, you've got all those incredible shades uh, that the sun is putting on that. uh, I don't know. What is that? Clover? Is that that wheat? It's just something. It's there. It's in the field. And and the animal looks majestic and regal. And many of us, if we were if we were likening ourselves to a uh, to an ant, this would be one. Hey, man, there's that, that's a good looking animal. Um, but then if we thought about say a goat, we're not going to go there yet. But a goat, like, why would you want to be a goat? I'm going to tell you, you want to be a goat before we're done. But here's why: many of us spiritually are like this African impala. See, it's an incredible animal because it can jump ten feet high or more. Like it just it, most all of them on average ten feet. Some of them more. In addition to that, with one leap, that animal can jump thirty feet. Now, some of y'all don't know what thirty feet is. I want to. Um, it's, 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 it's 10 paces. That's what it is. So you, I'm losing them on the camera. Can y'all see where I'm standing like right here on this corner? I hadn't measured this off. We're just going to guess. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to have to take nine, 10. I think it was 10. That's a long way in one leap, right? But here's the problem. And I used to sight my bow in that way. I'm not really good at it. It wasn't in, but uh, 10 yards, 30 feet, long way. Here's the deal. If you put a three or four foot fence up in front of that animal though, it's ca- completely captive. I mean, it doesn't even take a high fence to keep the African impala in. And here's the problem. 
That beautiful animal with all that potential and all the opportunity that's inside, if it cannot see, here's the thing, if it cannot see where it's going to land, it won't jump. It won't be who it was built to be if it does not have faith at what is going to be on the other side. That it's going to have a place to land and land. Now you, you, you starting to see this? And here's what I'm telling you. Now, this is not, this is not you compared to others. This is not, uh, there's, there's, there, there's those that are doing it right and those that are... As one who has a voice in your life, at least for this moment, for this hour, I want you to know that I know and God knows. I know because God's Word says so. There's more in you than what you've lived up to yet. There's more in you potential-wise than what you have, have been able to experience. And some of you are like, okay, well, I want to do that. I want... God wants you to tap into that. But in order for you to tap into that, you have to surrender completely and fully to Him. And part of that surrender means surrendering agenda, surrendering doubts, surrendering things that are holding you back from being willing to act in faith even when you can't see on the other side. Because that's the essence of faith, is it not? The, the, the essence of faith is, is that we don't know where we're going to land, but we trust the one uh, who has our future, right? For the dark places that we can't see. Now, let me just pause for a second. There's another creature out there that I rather would like to, uh, to, 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 to model my spirituality after, if you will. It's a mountain goat. I mean, I don't know if a mountain goat's a pretty animal. In fact, this one really isn't pretty compared to what I just showed you. But it ain't a scared animal. I mean, think about it. We're living in treacherous times. We're living in times that are, that are difficult. And you know it is. Like, you know when you look at the, the national news, the world news, local stuff, your own, uh, you look around and you, you recognize the world that, that, that we're raising our families in, all that kind of stuff. There's a tendency to just be, comp I mean, constantly looking down. I mean, don't you know if you put, if you put, the, if you put the Impala in the same place, that Impala's going to be just scared to death because he's always looking down, always looking back. Isn't this what we do as believers if we're not careful? But what about? But what about this? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what about this? And so and so. And then and it gets worse because then there's people all up in our ears saying, hey, you know that that won't work. You know you can't do that. You know, you know that's, that's, it, 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 there's easier ways to do that. But, but trusting God on this one, man, don't, don't dare do that. That's not going to work. Like this is the world we live in. And yet these mountain goats, they don't know any different. Like it's just who, they're just being who they are. Most of them were born in high places. And within, within just a few days of their birth, they begin to follow mama along the trail in places that they just naturally, they don't know any different. They're just doing what they do. Watch this quick video, then I'm going to dig into the text. But watch this video about these mountain goats. I like these mountain goats, man. They're kind of cute. These guys are some of the most sure-footed animals on earth. Baby mountain goats have to catch on quick. Just days after birth, they make this treacherous terrain their playground. Sharp, cloven hooves find tiny holds in the rock face. And strong legs power them up the mountainside. Now, if you keep watching the video, you go home and look at it later. It says that they have to practice a lot to get to where they can climb that way. But they start early, and it's all that they ever know. Here's what's crazy. I'm not calling you a mountain goat, right? I, like, I know that. You're not. I mean, you are an animal, but not, not that kind of animal. We are, we are flesh and blood. But it gives us an image to say, not this, but this. Not being, some, some of you this morning, like, if we were honest and you looked at your life, you're going, you, you, you might even think just in this moment, you know, for much of the last period of time or much of my spiritual journey, I have, I've had a bad case of the African Impala syndrome. Like, I really think that's a thing we should start calling at times. It's like, hey, you know what? That's, that's, that right there is a struggle. That's that struggle that says, I really would like to have incredible faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But really, you know, I, I, I'm, I, the potential's there, but I'm not going to jump. Like, I, I'm going to live right here in this safe space. Well, things are, they're, they're not real safe right now. On the other hand, we have these mountain goats that are demonstrating great ability not even be able to see always how they're going to get around the corner. You ought to see some of the pictures, really, if you ever look it up, of all the incredible places that these little little rascals can go. They can do some insane stuff. Now, how does that relate to Daniel? Well, Daniel is actually not present for today's story in, in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, he has given us an account of it. Some have said, well, where was he? I don't think he was in the myriad of folks that bowed and worshipped the king's idol. Uh, I just don't. I mean, there's nothing in the, in the text that would lead us to believe that he was. It never says that he was. And in addition to that, it makes a whole lot more sense to assume he was out of town doing the king's bidding. 
because he was uh, in ele- like he's gotten favor for honoring God. And so each time we've looked through the book of Daniel, chapter by chapter, chapter one, chapter two, now we get in chapter three, he kept getting elevated. And so he was, he was kind of the leader of these other three. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now, though, without him present, they still are going to stand firm. And so I want to do my best to, to summarize the first part of the chapter and then walk as quickly as I can, because I've done this once. I know that there's, there's limited time here, right? And I'm committed to being um, as beneficial with you guys, giving you every bit I can give you within the time allotted. And so um, let me just tell you that King Nebuchadnezzar, even though he had recognized that, I'm going to give you the background on Daniel 3, even though he recognized that, that Daniel was able to interpret uh, the, the dream that he had and do things no, nobody else could, and he recognized his God was special amongst other gods. It didn't take long until he just he he was, oh I don't know he he was so up to his eyeballs in his own little world and his own kingdom. He was the most powerful guy at the time uh, in the world, and essentially he decided to make a statue to himself. And it was a tall statue. It wasn't a little t- statue. It wasn't a teeny tiny statue. I mean, it was uh, 60 cubits, which they say was basically a cubit. It was about 18 inches. Somebody out here is going to do the math. But the bottom line was, the commentators say you probably could see this thing for 15 miles. Now, whether or not they built, the, the, uh, whether or not they built a, a big uh, foundation and then put the, uh, the, 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 the image of Nebuchadnezzar on top, or whether or not the, the, the fa- there was not, not much of a foundation, it was all the way up, um, one would have been kind of a, a better proportioned Nebuchadnezzar, and the other one would have been a tall, really, really skinny Nebuchadnezzar. Those that have studied this stuff, I don't think it really matters which, they could have seen it for 15 miles. And really what the first uh, seven or eight verses tell us is that he created a law, a proclamation, and said, look, everybody who's anybody in any position, whenever all the musics and all the music and all the different instruments are played, they're going to all bow down and they're going to worship this image of me as though it were a God. They're going to worship this golden Nebuchadnezzar. Now, by the way, we, don't, we, we think it probably was gold-plated. It could have been all gold. Regardless, it was a golden image that he now was, he, this created a problem. You see the impossible problem, right? Because as followers of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they were not at liberty to make that bow, to bow and to worship. And they wouldn't. And, and we literally see that they did not. And so there were three amongst all of them that were a part of the leadership and in, in the group that he commanded that if they did not bow and worship when the music played, that they would be thrown in the fiery furnace. Now, some of you, I, you, you literally listen to this and you're like, well, that was easy enough, man. It's really not that big a deal. God would understand. Just bow with everybody else and move along. Like, why is that really a big deal? Well, I got to tell you, the reason it was a big deal is because God said it was a big deal. And he's the one that sets the agenda. That's our struggle sometimes is we, 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 we either don't know or we don't look close and we're, we assume, we, give, we put feelings, we, we give human characteristics to God where God, that, that aren't even accurate human characteristics of God. Right? Like we put feelings in his mouth that would he understand? He never has understood when we would pick other things before him. So with that being said, I don't want to get into all the points before I actually get going. Let me, let me look at, with you at Daniel chapter 3. Um, and I'm going to begin with verse 8. I, don't, I think this is what I gave him before. We're going to start there. It says, there, Therefore at the certain time Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. So first round of opportunity to worship was over. He promised a fiery furnace for anybody that didn't. There were three that didn't. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there were some guys that I think probably wanted to be in charge and weren't, didn't like the fact that these, these Jews from, uh, from somewhere else had come in and they had gotten favor, right? God had, you remember all these stories? You need to go back and look at the other messages or look back at the first two chapters. God gave them favor because they were faithful to him. And so they were elevated within the kingdom. These fellows didn't like that. Oftentimes, when there's an impossible uh, set of circumstances, there are people involved that make it worse. Like that hum- humanity it, it, throughout uh, the, the text, there's often that group. Here's some politics at play. And so this group of people came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Boy, they're sweet talking him. Uh, you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of, and then he's going to list all these instruments off, They'll fall down and worship the golden image. If they don't, they'd be cast in the fiery furnace. Then they start with their argument against these men. Verse 12, there are certain Jews that you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Like you, king, you put them in charge. You elevated them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men pay no attention to you. 
They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. And so the accusation's been made. You can almost see them filling him up with all the reasons he should be upset. Then in verse 13, it says, Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage. So he was mad. What's interesting, and I'm like, again, I'm, I'm racing through some of this. He's going to give them a second chance. That was kind of weird because you don't see kings give people second chances. Like it's stated, consequence was stated. Sometimes consequence isn't even stated, like in the scripture. But like if you don't do right and do what he wants, he'll just take you out anyway. But he told them what the consequence was going to be. They didn't do it, and yet he must have liked them some. At least that's what the commentator said. Hey, he probably liked them a lot. And so he had them, come on in, like bring them to me. So then it says, he brought them in and says, is it really true? And he finishes his statement to them by saying in verse 15, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Like if you don't, I know your God could interpret a dream. But is this same God going to keep you from dying in the fiery furnace that I throw you in? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. We know our God can. And he will deliver, deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, this is powerful. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. In other words, we know that our God can, but even if he chooses not to, we'll still serve him and not you. Do you get the fake that is, de- and I, I'm getting into the, the message, it said, do you get the fake that's being demonstrated when these men say, even if I can't understand why God would choose not to do what he could do in this moment, and ultimately, We give our life in faith to him because we would not bow. Even so, I'm trusting that he knows what he's doing and that if I'm playing a part in the bigger picture, we're good with that. We will serve him. That's a big deal. It's a huge deal. Because so oftentimes, we we don't understand why. Why did God not do what he could have done? And it's a challenge to us faith-wise to know that even if God d- doesn't give me what I want in a given day, doesn't let the medical turn out like I'd like, the business stuff turn out like I like, the relationship, it doesn't go my way, that doesn't mean God's still not in charge. That doesn't mean that we should, should pivot or that God's not faithful or that He's not able. These men, had, these men had mountain goat kind of faith. These men didn't have African impala kind of faith. These men were standing there saying firmly, We don't know how this is going to turn out. And even though we don't know how this is going to turn out, we're going to do what God said. We just I don't think they were mean about it or rude about it, but they were blunt in the sense that they were committed. No matter what the outcome might be, they trusted God with the outcome regardless and said, we will do what the king has asked, or what what our king, King King Yahweh, uh, has asked us to do. So, um, After this response, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. That's an even stronger term than him being furious and filled with rage. He made the, the, it's going to tell us that he heated the furnace up seven times hotter. If he really was trying to torture him, he should have cooled it off a little bit. Let it be a slow roast, right? Uh, He's like, what kind of guy comes up with that? The commentator that I was reading, one of them, I was like, huh, he had a lot more time on his hands than I do. Uh, but, But the fact is, he made it hotter. Sometimes when we're rash, sometimes when we're heated, we do things that really aren't smart. You're going to see that it's not smart here in a minute because he's going to give up three of his best men that go to throw them in. And so he says he was filled with fury. He said, I'm going to heat it up. Verse 20, he ordered some of the mighty men of his army, the best that he had, to bind them and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. He bound them with all of it, tunics, cloaks, hats, other garments that they were were thrown into the fiery furnace. His order was so urgent, the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men he took up with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three, these three men, Meshach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell into the burning, fiery furnace. You think, oh, well, they gave their lives up. That's that. No, here's what's crazy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound. They were bound, now they're unbound. Walking in the, that's right, 
That, that's, God, that's Jesus himself standing right there. We think, we think that's actually, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Here's what's crazy. They got to experience walking through the fire with God present with them. Well, how incredible. I mean, do you get, you, if they had not stood firmly, done what others most would not have done, done what most would have said, okay, hey, look, God really doesn't care, but he's not going to ask us, ask us to actually take that kind of a stand. That doesn't make a lick of sense. But yet these men did take, they took God as word. And so they're getting to experience something that few others have. Now, I, I won't linger here, but let me tell you that what they call this, when you see one that looks like, a, here it says a son of the gods, um, later he describes him as an angel. There are a number of places in the Bible before the birth of Jesus Christ, like the, we call that the incarnation, God made flesh, right? In the person of Jesus. There are several instances in the Old Testament where, well, there's someone who appears that looks like God, we think is a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus pre-incarnate. I'm blowing your mind if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. I get it. Um, but here, when, when the Bible says in the Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God, it is a picture of Jesus Christ, God's Son, being present before He took the form of flesh and became man. Jacob in the wilderness wrestling with God, very likely another Christophany. But the beautiful picture for all of us, regardless of what you want to believe about whether that was Jesus or not Jesus, God walked with these three men even though they went into the fire. He walked with them there. The promise in the New Testament God has made to us that when he gave the commission is that I will be with you always even until the end of the age. It would also be worth noting that this is the first Historically, at least what I read said that this is the first um, martyrdom by fire on record. Except this is the martyrdom that wasn't. I mean, they would, they, they've burned some folks since then. Um, and what I find so encouraging for us is that because they took the step of faith, not knowing how it was going to turn out, they got to experience something few others ever do. Like mountain goat kind of faith. Not just looks pretty on, online, makes a pretty picture, plays all the parts, says all the things right and nice. No, no, no. Literally experience the presence of God and see God do what is really unexplainable. That's a big deal. If you watch to the end of it, he, he, he now is going to uh, call them out. They were bound and thrown in. <laughs> he, they're going to walk out. He's going to say, hey, y'all come out of there. And they're going to walk out. And it says, he says, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. All these people that had gathered around that were going to worship, they saw that the fire had not any power over their bodies. Their, the hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Catch what he says. Who trusted in him and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Then he does what this king always does. He made a decree, right? Any people, nation, or language that speaks against any of God, uh, against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn. This isn't godly, okay? But he did it. Uh, shall shall be torn limb from limb. It's the second time we've heard him say this. It's just a different scenario. He's going to be torn limb from limb, and his house is laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then. I may not come back to this, but I want you to catch it. They demonstrated faith where there seemed to be no place to land. But they did what God said do. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They got God's favor for insane kind of faith. Now, as we look at the text as a whole, we live in treacherous times. All of you, if you're looking at life, there's some impossible things in your life. Um, and, and you can get as big a view or narrow a view on that as you'd like. We want to know how to live. I mean, I want you to know how to live by faith in impossible times. How do you do that? Because things do seem pretty treacherous. I mean, if we're talking about 
elevated spaces and places where the, the stakes are high and the tripping hazards seem real. And, you know, it's, it's worrisome that how's this going to go and what if that happens and what if Russia and what if Ukraine and what about taxes? What about inflation? What about locally about X or Y or Z? What about relationship? And what if, what if I, I'm just talking where some of you are at. What if I don't find a, a, a person that, that I can marry? Will I be lonely? What if I get COVID? What if I, what if I, um, uh, what if I, I go broke because of, of, of all the circumstances surrounding some of this? We have all these fears impossible times, and yet we serve a God who allows us to be able to take the next step forward in Him. So first, there's this impossible problem, and these guys in the middle of this impossible problem, they see the impossibility of it. Like, they knew what God said. For, for starters, they literally knew what God wanted. He wanted to be first. He was a jealous God, is a jealous God. And yes, the Ten Commandments say in Exodus 20, but also um, just when the law was handed down in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says this, five, chapter 5, Verse 7 through 9. This was the command that they were given as, um, as Jews about God. And, and the command that we, we should take as well. You shall have no other gods before me. Like that's in the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven uh, or above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow to them or serve them. Hadn't they kind of been told don't do that? Right? And so um, he says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those that hate me. So at that point, it didn't really, it didn't really matter what the greater group of folks outside those three that were followers thought. It really didn't matter what any of the three thought if it was different than what God had said. But gratefully, they were in unity that God said, don't, we can't, we can't do this. And it doesn't sound like they made a huge deal about it. They just didn't do it. And then these other fellows kind of brought it to the attention, and so now it's a problem. Um, but it was an impossible problem. Secondly, faith, faith puts God first. So times are, times are treacherous. Times are impossible. What does our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in the same God these guys had faith in, what does that require of us? Our uh, surrender to Christ, lordship to Christ, salvation in Christ requires us to put Him first. This is not simple. Like, it's easy to say, it's hard to live out. Especially when you don't know how this is going to land. Right? Like, you don't know where you're going, what it's going to look like on the other side of this decision that's being made. And again, the pressure would have been pretty heavy. Just go, like, look, you guys have been elevated in the kingdom. You know that you just do the thing. God understands. Well, they didn't. I also want to kind of indicate, if I can, it, it, this is where we live. Like, this is our world. We we often don't put God first. Is that, a, is that a fair statement about all of us? That generally, maybe, maybe, maybe you get you're more generous with yourself than, 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 than what the Scriptures are with each of us. It's human to care about oneself. It really is human. And, and in addition, in this process of identifying like, what is first in our life, you know, if we, if we took this just a hair past this one commandment of don't worship any other gods, we're, a lot of us are confident if somebody... If somebody was like telling us we'd lose our life if we chose Jesus, we're going to stand firm and say, hey, I trust Jesus. I'd like to believe that I'm that firm to do that, that you'd be that firm to do that. Um, can I be candid with you? Nobody in this world, in this county, in, in my lifetime and before that I'm aware of has ever put a gun to anybody's head and said, choose Jesus bow, or bow, bow to this God or, or you will die. In fact, I'm going to just tell you that I don't think that if you're talking about what the likelihood and the odds are of you being poised with with graven images versus God, I don't think that's a real high possibility. Well, let me tell you what's happening every day. What's happening all the time in our life is that there are things competing with the role that God has in our life. You heard me talk earlier about honesty. It really kind of goes into covetousness relative to business, right? That's in the Ten Commandments. He says not to lie. He says not to steal. He says not to cheat. He's told, like, literally, the Ten Commandments in, in, in inevitably are... Well, the first four are about how we relate to God, and the other six are about how we relate to one another. We find it in the New Testament in relationship to Jesus Christ. Love God and love your neighbor. And, and so we put God first. And when we put God first, the other stuff works itself out. You say, well, what are you getting at? Well, we find ourselves in relationship, and then all of a sudden we're like, well, God understands that things aren't going well, and He would have me do different. He would, have, he would understand, even though you know, we may not even know what the Word says. These guys knew what the Word said. That's a starting point because it mattered. I'm just telling you, I think there's an awful lot of us that think it's all right to cheat. 
I think it's become uh, so commonplace in the schools that, that, that who, who would be the person even that would say Christians shouldn't? Like, who would be the person that if you could get away with it and nobody calls you on it, why would you actually do the right thing? Like, if they're not calling you on it and coming and checking up behind you, why would you do it just because you said you would? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because a man should be a man of his word. I mean, not just is that a... I don't know, there's a part of me that wants to swagger a little bit and say, that's what real men do. But actually, that's what the Scripture teaches. Your yes is yes and your no is no, and it doesn't matter what the rest of the score is, right? The same is true about... This whole other list, coveting what others have. How many folks have you known that like the Chaldeans, if somebody else is successful, rather than celebrating, they got to have a reason why, right? Well, they did this and they did that. Let's pull them down so that we can get a step up. All of these are attitudes, if we're not careful, that drive us. Some of you, before you had an opportunity, like before you were old enough to, to be married and, and you were trying to evaluate relationship in life, if you're not careful, the fear of not being with someone would cause you to to do relationship, well, let's just say do it differently than what Doug would teach over at, at Pink and Blue. Uh, but then for others, for others, it, you, 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 you were in marriage relationship. Now you're not in marriage relationship. And, and how you move forward looking for that, you really should put God first. Like you really should say in all of my relationships now and moving forward, you're like, but, but wait a minute. If I do that the way God said do it, I'm going to end up lonely by myself. Like I'm going to look like the goat instead of like the African Impala. And I would say, so? Who are you serving? You want to be the pretty goat on Instagram or you want to be the mighty, I'm going to give him a name, Benaiah, who is that goat, one of the mighty men of God. You look it up, 2 Samuel 20, 23. But in, in that, who do, you, who do you really want to serve? Like, do you want to be the one that's constantly living in fear, full of potential, but never achieves the potential because you're scared to follow God for fear that you might not, it might not work out? Or you might not, because... You know, that's a big fear. Or you, will you lay the fears aside and refine your faith so that you don't know any different except to just make the jump in the high places with all of it on the line. Trusting God that He's in charge and you're not. You're not looking back and saying, man, I got that one wrong. You're looking at the next place and you're pressing on in Him. You can let the chorus of all the other impalas right? Who also won't jump, therefore they don't want you to jump. You can let that chorus get up in your head. Like, I'm just talking about the narrative in the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Like, I'm not naive enough to believe the world's in a great place right now. But I'm just, I don't know. I guess I trust God enough to know He's in charge. I mean, I'm pretty sure that me listening to the news this afternoon and trying to fix Russia ain't gonna work. Like, I don't have, I don't have a say. Uh, but I got you in front of me right now, and I can encourage you to be more like God. Like, I want to be that guy. Like, I want to go places, and I want to I, I want to climb in heights that, that, that others can't hardly breathe spiritually. And I want to be able to do it because I'm trusting God. It's not that I want to be better. I want you to go with me. Come on, let's, can, we, can we go together? Can we be a whole bunch of goats? I mean, I think it'd be great. And some of you are like, man, you just are not a refined fella calling us out like that. I don't think, I'm not saying I'm John the Baptist, but I don't think he was very refined. I don't think any of the prophets were. And yet they spoke on behalf of, of God, the heart of God. This is God's heart. You say, well, how do you get there? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not wake up on that day and all of a sudden take this dramatic stand. You've heard the rest of Daniel already. Like if you, and so you know because you've heard the rest of Daniel, they had a foundation. These guys, last week, they went back and prayed and sought God's mercy and they saw God faithful. Well, now, they, they didn't want much time to pray, but they just said, look, Daniel, question here. God saved us then. He's going to be in it now. We're putting it on Him. And how it turns out on him, not on, isn't it great? It's just kind of, it's kind of a relief. You say, man, I, I thought that whole verse about his yoke is easy, his burden is light. This don't sound easy at all. Well, it's nice to just follow after God's, like what he's told you to be about. When you, once you realize that you're not really always on the planning committee, like your job's to do what he told you to do and to not do what he told you not to do. But for these guys, they are. They didn't have to decide, do we do it, do we not? They'd already been told, don't do it. All right, so let me, let me let, the process habits. Y'all with me or am I losing you? Or y'all hung up on goats? You, you, you good? Let me give you three. Some of you need the points. I'm going to give you the points because you got to have those. It won't be a complete sermon without them. Um, three keys that will help you be faithful. Number one, knowledge. What's God commanded? And look, you should be suspect. If you can't go to the Bible and find it yourself and reread it recently, Go get the context. Look at it. Don't just say, well, God would be okay with this, or there's that story. Put it in context. Know what God commanded. Live it, learn it, lean into it. You're like, well, I don't know all that. Yeah, but 
we're trying to help you do that. You can do that. There's more information that's ever been available. You just gotta, you gotta want that more than some other stuff. Community. Community makes a difference. Hey, listen, it's just crazy to me. There are 18 families that are, have enrolled their child or like father, son kind of thing in our event tonight for Nerf and Nachos. 18 families that are not part of this church family. New families. You say, what does that mean? It means people are looking to connect with other believers in Bay County, not just because they want Nerf and Nachos. I mean, I met a young fellow today. He, he wants Nerf and Nachos, and, and that's good. But let me tell you what mom and daddy want. Mom and daddy want their child not to be by themselves seeking to honor Jesus. These are families that are moving to this area that are looking for a, I mean, it's a Shadrach looking for Meshach and Abednego, right? It's, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looking for a Daniel, somebody that'll stand firm and, and take the lead. Can I tell you what the difference is between having just like one standing alone and three? Like, I wish I had a statistical uh, calculator for what the strength in faith would have been, but it's easier together. Look in Ecclesiastes, right? That ain't even a marriage passage, by the way, where it talks about three stronger than, than two and, and two stronger than one, but it's real. It's why we talk about it at weddings sometimes. God has said, look, community matters. Some of you, you, you want that. you got to be consistent. You can't just come one time and say, all right, y'all do it. Y'all do it to me. Let, let, let me, give me. Give me the community. Y'all bring it to me right here. It's got to be perfect today. It doesn't start feeling normal. It starts you allowing yourself to be accountable to others in a way that, that, that's kind of strange, right? Because you like to do the, your agenda all the time by yourself. But here's what I'm telling you. I'm kind of excited. Here's what you need to hear. We want to help with that. If there's another way in place that you can get that, that's great. But this is going to help you be faithful if there are others standing there with you. It's why Collide matters. It's why the wreck matters. It's why what we're doing with the children matters. It's why you and this small group and even being here today like that, it matters. It's why sitting around at a table on Wednesday nights and they're eating a meal with people that you see on a regular basis that can encourage you. Say, hey, man, how, 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 how's your week going? You know, and they can cheer you on and they can tell you you're praying for you. Finally, these guys had practice. Faith throws with use. Did you hear out of the little, the little goats? Did you hear they learned that? Within days. Like literally, many times these things, these goats are born at the top of the mountain and, and they, they don't have a way down except learning how to walk it. And, and, and they, they go in this high place where there are very few predators but they follow the, the other ones. They just follow and learn. We've been talking about modeling. We've been talking about finding one that's already been places that you want to go and, and walking along that journey with them. That's, this, this is that simple model. Um, and, and so we just, and then and after time, guess what? You don't know any different. This is just who we are. Others be standing on the outside. They're like, man, that's crazy. How that, like, I don't, I don't know how the, that's, that's unattainable. And the person standing over here like, well, I don't know. I'm just trying to follow God. He said to do it, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. And it doesn't mean you can't remember those days back. And listen, I'm not where I want to be. I'm just telling you, I'm, there's this illustration about burning the ships. I burned them a long time ago. Like at this point, I ain't going back. Like, like to whatever, like I want to, I just want to honor Jesus. I want to be more like him. I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, here's what's crazy. Some of you would love for me to get into some kind of political talk about, uh, about guns. I'll shoot your guns. I like guns. Guns are good, man. Uh, but steel shot's been hard to come by lately. That's what, I, what, what I'm told. I'm not fighting that fight. Like, like here, Nobody in Bay County is coming to take your guns. You just know that. They're just, they're just not. There are people in Bay County that need to know Jesus. I'm about it. I want to step forward in my faith. That's my, that's my agenda. And, so, so, and it should be all of our agenda, right? So what I'm saying is let's spend time and energy focusing on the things and practicing the things that will grow our faith. Because you're not going to just wake up one day. Everybody wants faith like Daniel. Everybody wants faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We all want to be like Moses. We all, nobody wants to do what they did. You said, no, no, no. God just miraculously and gloriously. I'm just going to tell you, Peter gave his life for Jesus. That's how he finished his. There wasn't hardly, I mean, we, we, tradition tells us, I mean, we don't, we don't hardly know an apostle that, wasn't, that didn't suffer. So we've got this ill-conceived picture that being spiritually mature automatically happens. Jesus saves you in an instant. But we practice Christianity. I don't have it. I'm, I mean, I am saved. But I am practicing what it means to follow Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to bow my knee to Jesus. And I'm going to give you this final illustration because I know I'm just about out of time. This hit me this, this morning. And, and I'm going to slide this out of the way. So imagine all this music playing, and, and the, everybody was demanded, was, they were commanded to bow in the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And these men said no. 
Now for just a second, think about what these same guys did every single day, probably multiple times a day if they were a good Jew. They would have gotten on their knees and they would have bowed their heart and they would have bowed their lives and they would have bowed their agenda privately and at times publicly with their family and not with their family and said, God, you are, you are the great God. You are the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You are the God of... You, you, you are God of Mary, the mother of Jesus. When she was told that her son would be the Messiah, she, she, she listened to you. You were, you were the God, yes, that David served. You were the God uh, of all these New Testament saints that, that, that were saints because they surrendered. I'm, I'm telling you this. In order for us to be that person on that day that doesn't bow, it doesn't make a lick of sense to me that we wouldn't also be the person that in the small things bowed our agenda to God. One of the things that I, I think Jesus showed me this week, I certainly found it in Scripture. I don't know how many times I've read the parable of the, of, of, of the, the minus, the meanest, whatever it's called. They, God gave opportunity. Some took the little and did something with it. Others did nothing. To whom those that were faithful with little, what did Jesus say He would do? He would give them much. Sowing and reaping, biblical principle. God made it so when He created the world. It's illustrated through Scripture. If you don't sow habitually to have giant faith, you're not going to reap it. You reap what you sow. You say, well, is it about works? No, it's about the grace of Jesus Christ, but then daily practicing what it means to bow a knee to Jesus and then bow every other area of our life to Him. You got it? I want... I want to march forward. Throw me, throw me up the goat one more time. Then we're going to come sing. I want the goat, the big goat, the pretty goat. Not pretty goat. Benaiah. A mighty goat. Say, ain't a mighty goat. No, that one right there. Old Testament. God said, listen, as you go, as you go and pick the new king, don't be looking at appearances. I'm not, I'm not looking for that one that's beautiful. I'm not looking for the African Impala Instagram photo. I'm looking for that one. It's going to jump even though he doesn't know where he's going to land. I ain't judging anybody else on how they do their faith, but I'm telling you, I want us to be a group of folks that try our very best to be faithful to God and to just let it become a part of who we are, that God says jump. We get wise counsel. But at the end of the day, we want to do what God has asked us to do. You can do it, guys. There's so much more potential in the, than you know. Ephesians 3.20. But in order for you to actually realize that potential, you got to jump. you got to take that step of faith day by day by day by day. So let's do it. How can we do it? Well, we got a living hope. We're going to sing about the living hope as we go out of here. If you want to know more about Jesus, I want to tell you more about Jesus. But we want to help you in each of these areas. Know the Word, community, create habits. Um, we want to join you on this journey of becoming more like Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for uh, an audience that has allowed themselves to be captive this morning. Lord, they literally surrendered to staying at home and warm and under the covers. And they got up and they came and they brought their families Lord, I know that there's so many in this room that, I, like I sense it week by week, they literally truly are hungering to know what you desire and to be faithful and to be obedient. And some of them are trying so hard. Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged. It is not about our effort, but it is, Lord, it is about us daily taking up a cross. And that cross being taken up is essentially our saying every day, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with what I can't see. I trust you as the God that sees in the dark, that sees around the corner, that sees off that cliff. And Lord, I'm going to be faithful right up until the end of the sight that you've given me. And then, Father, I trust you. Help us to take that step of faith today. Help us to do it your way when it doesn't seem to fit our way. Because we bend our life not to any other God or any other thing or person or relationship. We bend our life and our agenda to yours. Oh, God, shape us. Give us giant faith. Help us to be able to jump even when we don't know how it's going to turn out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.